Hi, everyone. Uh, welcome. Thank you so much for joining us tonight uh, for our event with Scott James. This is the launch for his new book, Trial by Fire, a devastating tragedy, 100 lives lost in a 15 year search for truth. My name is Evan Karp. I am the events manager for Booksmith. We're an independent bookstore and a mainstay of San Francisco's Haight Ashbury district since 1976. Uh, tonight, though, as I mentioned, we're uh, here to celebrate Trial by Fire, the new book by Scott James. Um, joining Scott in conversation is Pamela Watts. Pamela Watts is a New England journalism icon, a favorite, a favorite local news anchor and reporter for three decades. She led news broadcasts on both ABC and CBS affiliates, plus launched WRNI, an affiliate of National Public Radio. She's the recipient of two Emmy Awards as top news anchor in New England and dozens of other journalism and broadcasting honors. And Scott James is the best-selling author of the novels The Sower and Soma, a finalist for the National uh, Lambda Literary Award for Debut Fiction under the pen name Kimball Scott. With his weekly eponymous San Francisco column for the New York Times, James found stories that drew coverage from other national and international media, including the New Yorker, the London Times, the Guardian, and many more. He's been honored with three Emmy Awards for his work in television news. He lives in San Francisco and is co-founder of the Castro Writers Cooperative, known as the, co as the Coop, um, a co-working space for Bay Area writers. Um, but I want to thank you all for being here tonight. And um, Scott, welcome and congratulations on the book. It's always nice to see you. And um, Pamela, thank you so much for uh, joining us tonight. I will uh, turn it over to you guys now. Thank you so much, Evan. Thanks for being so gracious. And to everyone watching, we hope you will ask questions. We will make time for that. So there is a lot, I'm sure, to discuss tonight. But for Scott and for myself, this is wonderful. We started our television journalism careers together. So it's a professional reunion of sorts for us tonight. And uh, it's also prime timing, as we like to say, because the book Trial by Fire just published this week and already here's what people are saying publishers weekly called, gave it a starred review and said quote that it's gripping meticulously researched james draws on his knowledge of that state's politics and in interviews with the principal players to present a complete affecting picture of the tragedy's terrible human cost this is essential reading for true crime fans and also the Sun Chronicle, a newspaper from Scott's uh, original home state of Massachusetts uh, said this, quote, everything you thought you knew about the fire probably is wrong, but this is not a book simply about uncovering truths. This is a book about people whose lives were changed forever by the blaze. You know, when this fire happened, it was back in 2003 and it was, uh, be was went worldwide. It became one of the deadliest criminal cases in the United States. So Scott, for refresh people's memory or for those who did not know about this, can you tell us how this tragedy unfolded the moment it began? Sure, sure. Well, first I want to uh, <clears throat> thank Evan and the Booksmith for having me. Uh, terrific place, uh, one of the gems of uh, the independent bookstore. Uh, circuit and one of my favorite places in San, here in San Francisco. Um, and I also want to make sure to, to uh, thank you, Pam, and also to let uh, uh, viewers know that um, part of Pam's connection to this uh, tragedy is that she was the anchor of the local news uh, in Rhode Island when this happened. Thousands of people uh, woke up. Uh, the, uh, the, the fire happened overnight. They woke up on a Friday morning to discover that this awful thing had happened. So before we start talking, I want to set you up a little bit about what we're talking about. Trial by Fire is the true story of the Station Nightclub Fire. A uh, hundred people were killed when the rock band Great White set off fireworks inside a small nightclub in West Warwick, Rhode Island. And I actually have a video that I'm going to share with you that explains what happened, uh, and then we're gonna come back after that and discuss it. So hold on as I share my screen. It was a night like any other, a festive club filled with laughter and fun. But as we all know, it would be a night that would always be remembered. February 20th, 2003. The aging rock band Jack Russell's Great White 
performed at the station, a small roadside nightclub in the old New England mill town of West Warwick, Rhode Island. The show began with fireworks, 15-foot glass in a club with 12-foot ceilings. A trickle of flame crawled up the wall. Moments later, columns of fire. In seconds, the stage and then the club became an inferno. 100 killed, hundreds hurt. The deadliest single building fire in modern American history, the nation's deadliest rock concert. As families mourned their dead and burn victims struggled to survive, the questions were overwhelming. Was this an accident or a crime? The nightclub had passed government fire and safety inspections. Why did it go up like a torch? Jack Russell and Great White claimed they had permission for fireworks at their shows and had no clue they were dangerous. A federal investigation recreated the disaster in a lab and showed deadly black smoke took the lives of those inside just 90 seconds after the fire started. No time for everyone to escape. Were there too many in the club? In the panic, there was a stampede toward one exit causing a bottleneck. Why not use the other three exits? The government pointed fingers and filed criminal charges, but those accused did not include Jack Russell and his bandmates. For survivors and families struggling to recover, there seemed to be no justice. And in the end, there were never any trials, not criminal, not civil. That meant the government's version of events was never vetted in court. People think that the legal system is a search for the truth, and it is not. It's a search for a result. A result that left unanswered questions. See, the story of the station nightclub fire is the story of loss, but it is also the story of the triumph of the human spirit. First responders rushing to the scene, strangers risking their own lives to pull each other out of the smoke. Now, a fuller explanation of what happened has emerged. Key figures have shared what they know for the first time. A story of people put through a crucible, of survivors, heroes, victims, villains, of a system that's supposed to be there to protect us. So there's a lot uh, to talk about here with this tragedy. Uh, as we mentioned, 100 people killed, uh, but there was an additional twist uh, in this story. So inside the nightclub, when the fire started, was a local TV news crew that just happened to be there working on a different story. And so their camera, the, the videographer's camera was rolling when the band set off the fireworks and when the place uh, erupted into an inferno. So the entire tragedy was captured on videotape. Now, in 2020, we're very used to the idea of things being captured on video. But in 2003, this was before the iPhone was even invented. Nobody had smartphones. It was extremely rare to capture on video uh, any sort of tragedy, and especially rare for a professional television journalist to capture something on video. That you really have to look at like the Hindenburg disaster at 9-11 to find incidents where an actual tragedy of this magnitude was captured on video. So that tape became a quite an unusual thing because it was so rare. So it wasn't just that it was such a horrendous tragedy and so many people died. Because of the video, the story went viral all over the world. Uh, probably tens of millions, if not hundreds of millions of people saw this story in all over the planet. I mean, I spoke to people who were uh, on a remote Greek island and saw this tragedy on television there, just like I saw it when I was living out here in California when it happened on that terrible night. And Scott, to see it, to view this again, to revisit it, to remember is so painful. Why, after all these years, did you decide to write this book? 
Well, uh, I grew up in a suburb of Providence, Rhode Island, and uh, I've always considered that to, to be my home. And uh, when I would come back to visit from time to time, uh, see my family and friends, they would say to me that they'd talk about the fire and they'd say that, you know, uh, we, we never feel like we got the full story or we never thought that justice was served. So after a while, about 10 years ago, I decided I would start asking questions because in my mind, this was really the worst thing to happen where I grew up. And I thought it was a story that was being forgotten. The lessons really were never learned. And so I thought, well, I'll, let's see if I can find out some of the answers to these, these questions. And Scott, we've all been in venues like this at concerts or performances, and I think we get caught up in the moment. And your book begins in the, in the, at the start with the moment of how deadly and how swiftly this fire happened. Can you just read a passage from us from page sure. one? Sure, sure. <clears throat> I can, um, I'll just read you how the, the book starts. So it uh, says, February 20th, 2003, 11.07 p.m. It takes 90 seconds to sing the Star Spangled Banner. Human beings, on average, can hold their breath for up to 90 seconds. A typical person needs 90 seconds to read one page of this book. 90 seconds marked the moment between life and death on the night of February 20th, 2003, at the station a scruffy, low-slung roadhouse nightclub in the old New England mill town of West Warwick, Rhode Island. Tragedy started with a song. Shortly after 11, the rock group Jack Russell's Great White took to the club stage with screeching guitars in the dark. On cue, the band's tour manager, Daniel Beakley, set off four gerbs. Giant sparklers set on the floor behind the lead singer, two blasting bolts of sparks to the sides, and two in the middle directed up toward the club's low, dark, glittered ceiling. The fireworks lasted 17 seconds and were meant to evoke the aging metal band's former stadium glory days from the 90s, creating an ethereal glow behind the performers. The audience went wild. So when the audience went wild, many of them thought that this was just part of the show, that these flames were actually special effects. And they stood there for many of them for as long as 30 seconds thinking that it was part of the act. And that 30 seconds, the time between realizing that there was a real danger uh, was a difference often for people between life and death, whether or not they could escape in time. Now, out here in California, we are experiencing today uh, with the fires that were happening all around the state where people are realizing the dangers of fire all too late. Fire travels faster than human beings can run. And we've seen that in communities here. And in the club, that was in fact the case. People could not get out to save themselves because things happened incredibly quickly. The reason things happened so quickly was not just because of the fireworks that the band set off, but because the, the club itself was filled with foam, foam that was meant to be soundproofing to prevent you know, the noise of the club from disturbing the, nature, the neighbors. But instead of the sound foam, which is what uh, the owners of the nightclub business uh, thought they had purchased, and sound foam is supposed to be flame uh, retardant by, by law. Instead, the foam that they had on their walls turned out to be packing foam, something that we use for shipping, and is in fact uh, an accelerant. It's like solid gasoline. Uh, the club was filled with the equivalent of 13 gallons of gasoline. So when those sparks hit that deadly foam, it went up like a torch. So many lives lost, so many lives destroyed by this fire and the impact that went through the community, through the state, through New England, and actually affected the families and friends of all of those who were inside the station nightclub. So many things went wrong. How did you bring the threads of this story together to, into clearer focus um, to kind of capture what it was like to be in that fire? Well, I think, you know, uh, there's, there's so many layers to this story uh, and a <clears> hundred <throat> victims, uh, hundreds hurt, thousands lives directly impacted by it. Uh, all of those people deserve to have their story told. Uh, all of the victims deserve to be memorialized and remembered. 
but you can't do that in the confines of a book. So what I needed to do was pick a handful of people, really a few who would represent the many as the central subjects of the book. And we follow them from before, during, and after this tragedy. But the people I picked were more than just random. The ones that are selected to be the main subjects of the book are people who also turn up in the right place at the right time for us to uh, learn key things about this tragedy. They are the witnesses, uh, they're there to bear witness to, to key moments of, of understanding what this is about. So literally they are the people in the room when events unfold that we report on and then we have a better understanding about what went wrong in this tragedy and frankly, what we need to do to make sure it doesn't happen again. One of the people that you follow in the book very closely is someone actually you and I both know quite well, and uh, he was a reporter who worked with us. Yes, so, uh, you know, in Rhode Island, it's a very small state, very parochial. Uh, there's, you know, there's the, remember the old saying, you know, there's six degrees of separation from everyone. Well, the Attorney General of Rhode Island likes to say that, well, in Rhode Island, it's not six degrees of se separation, it's more like a degree and a half. And so right. it seems like everybody knows everybody. And that certainly was the case with this fire, where it felt like you knew someone or knew someone who knew someone who was there. Well, in fact, I knew someone who was there, someone who was inside the fire, who was there when it broke out and barely escaped with his life. But the person I knew turned out to be the person who later would be accused of killing all of those 100 people. And that is a guy named Jeffrey Dedarian. Uh, more than 25 years ago, we worked together in television. Uh, I was the boss of the TV newsroom and he was one of my employees, he was a reporter. And so he, went from being the person who was the type of aggressive reporter who would chase people down the street. He'd send him out to do the live shots. He was the guy we'd send to the courthouse to, to say to the person as they were entering, you know, did you do it? Did you do it? He would go after the so-called bad guys. And then kind of in an instant, he went from being that guy to the person who the reporters were now looking after and saying, you know, did you do it? Did you do it? You know, the, the hunter became the prey, so to speak, a complete uh, reversal of fortune. Well, you know what's puzzling about the book, and I think this may strike a lot of people, is that it's being described as a true crime story and a, a real whodunit. But we know who done it because three people pleaded guilty to the, the deaths. Well, it's really uh, interesting is that um, uh, this story, this case, is a classic example of how the, the legal system works today. In fact, we're having a national reckoning right now about how the legal system works today. Uh, the fact is that in America, most people do not get their day in court. Uh, something like upwards of 97% of cases are handled through uh, settlements, through plea bargains. So the, the, the legal system that we see on TV with the big court dramas and evidence presented and everything is considered, that's not the reality for most people. And in fact, in this case, uh, people were pressured over the course of years to take a plea that they, to the point where they didn't think that the treatment of the system was gonna treat them fairly. And in this particular case, it's interesting in Rhode Island, Rhode Island has a history of corruption. It has a history of corruption in their court system. But there's one case that played uh, very significantly, frankly, in the decision of at least uh, some of the defendants to plead guilty. And that was a case of a guy named Scott Hornoff. He was a, a police officer uh, in one of the communities there. And Scott Hornoff uh, was uh, convicted and sent to prison for murdering a young woman who was apparently his uh, girlfriend. Well, Scott Hornoff didn't kill that young woman. And it would take years, years he would spend behind bars before someone literally came forward and confessed to committing that murder. So think about what we're saying here. A member of the law enforcement community in Rhode Island is railroaded, put into prison for a murder he did not convict, he did not commit. And they wouldn't let him out until after the, someone else had completely uh, uh, confessed to it. Well, in the case of the station fire, the same prosecutor who sent that innocent man to jail was assigned to this case. And that sent a very chilling message to the people on the other side. It was basically, look, in this state, we send our own to prison for things they actually didn't do. So what chance do you have to defend yourself in all of this? So it's no wonder that they took a plea bargain. And frankly, it's no wonder that people all across this country are kind of 
pressured into taking plea bargains. It's really part of the national conversation we're having right now. Scott, so many people in this book are people we have never really heard from about that fateful night and the aftermath. Uh, lots of people, including the Dedarian brothers. Can you tell me what you learned that for you was most uh, incredible? Well, first of all, every aspect of this case that has been, I guess people think it's some of sort of, uh, sort of open and shut case. Uh, uh, there's another side to all of it. So one of the issues in just talking about the Tadarians is why did they not come forward and share what they knew? And what you have is a situation where on the night of the fire, one of the state's uh, law enforcement officials, really the top one for that particular town, uh, while the, the fire is happening, and we don't know, as they said in that video, was it a crime or was it an accident? At this point, uh, the investigators should have, you know, they needed to find out. They didn't know. They just, nobody knew that the, the nightclub had that deadly foam in it. None of that was known right away. We're looking at the case now through a lens of 2020 and so much that we know about this fire. But in fact, in those early days, there was a lot to figure out. But before any of that was figured out, uh, a top law enforcement official went to the Associated Press and said, well, you know, it's, it's the nightclub owners. The club owners, they're the ones who um, are guilty and said that they would, were going to be indicted. This was a statement made before any investigation was done. Well, and up until that point, uh, the nightclub owners had been cooperating with the authorities, talking to the police, talking to investigators from the Attorney General's office. Um, but after it became known that a law enforcement official had basically already declared them guilty. Their lawyer said, you can't talk to these people anymore. You can't cooperate with this investigation because they've already decided that you did it. So at that point, uh, they stopped talking. And uh, frankly, I think it, it thwarted the investigation by not having these people fully in to find out what went wrong. Uh, so as you mentioned, Jeffrey Dedarian was a TV reporter. He was a journalist. So you would think that at that point, well, if you're, I can't you know, talk to the government, I'll go directly to the people and tell them my side of the story. Well, in fact, of course, their lawyer, like any good lawyer, would say, look, we're going to try this case in court. We're not going to try it in the court of public opinion on TV. Uh, but something else happened. In the, in the aftermath of the fire, uh, there was some uh, journalism that was done that was kind of uh, heavy handed. Uh, the Tadarians were not doing interviews, they were not talking to people, and the media was very aggressive with them. Uh, by my count, one local newspaper uh, in the aftermath of the fire did 122 stories featuring the Tadarians and only 18 stories featuring the person who actually lit off the explosives that ca caused the fire. Well, this is, you know, appeared to be biased. They didn't think they were being treated fairly. And then on the two month anniversary of the fire, as uh, the state is in incredible mourning, uh, local newspaper, the Providence Journal, did a huge six column front page story that basically said that the brothers had a quote unquote legacy of death. And they came up with this conclusion by looking at the Tadarians and said, well, you know, they're Armenian, they have Armenian heritage. That's a heritage that includes a, a terrible genocide. Uh, their mother had died when they were children. So this all added up to some sort of damnation uh, that they had a legacy of death. And once the brothers saw that headline, they decided they would never ever be treated fairly by the media. And they never, they vowed then never to speak to another reporter until I came along many years later. In fact, this book is the first time they explained their side of the case. Well, it strikes me, Scott, you know, reading the book, every page is something just stunning or a twist uh, in, the, in, in a real life plot that you couldn't have imagined. Um, with all of that, is there any particular moment that you said uh, when you were hearing about it for the first time? Because I, I was in the story at the station, knew Jeff, and I didn't know some of the things that come out in the story that are just incredibly, it, they're just incredible. You can't, it's, it's unbelievable. Did you have a moment like that when you were doing your investigation? I, honestly, Pam, every day I worked on this, I felt I had made some uh, discovery of something that would make any uh, person shake their head, just, you just wouldn't believe it. I think uh, there was an aha moment when I was looking at court do documents. So one of the things that happened over time um, 
we talked about how the Darians were never going to talk to a journalist again, and yet they ended up talking to me. But that was not an easy thing, even though I knew Jeffrey from 25 years ago, from him being my employee. employee I didn't really understand until I started asking questions that he had never spoken to anyone and he had this, this deep hate for, journal, for journalism and for the media. But over time, I was able to persuade him to talk. He eventually introduced me to his brother and his family members who also talked, but then they also gave me access to the defense materials. Basically, everything that the government was going to allege against them in court had an answer to it, had another opinion. And so among the things that I saw in those materials was the original order for that foam that went into the nightclub. The foam that the government said, well, these guys bought cheap foam and they killed all these people. And there I'm staring at this piece of paper where it says that they ordered sound foam those words, sound foam. And sound foam, by law, is supposed to be uh, sound, is supposed to be flame retardant. So when I saw that, I remember saying to them, I said, but wait a minute, who has seen this besides me? And they said, well, we got that from the attorney general's office as part of discovery. So one of the things that you discover in this case, in the sense it goes to the legal system, is that you know, there was a grand jury investigation. A grand jury was the ones that decided to hand down indictments in this case. But in Rhode Island, it's actually legal to withhold evidence from a grand jury that proves a person is innocent. Exculpatory evidence, you do not have to present it to the grand jury, even if the grand jury says to the prosecutors, is there any other side of this story? Is there anything you haven't told us that might change you know, how we feel about this? Huh. These are the exact same conversations we're having right now with cases like Breonna Taylor where the grand jurors are saying, well, you know, they didn't exactly let us come to any other conclusion than the one that they were, wanted us to have. So some of that happened here. Certainly questions about that happened here. And I lay all that out in the book so that people can consider it for the first time. Uh, let's talk a bit about uh, the, 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 the people who survived but are were still victims of the fire, the victims' mm -hmm. families who did perish in the fire. There were some incredible moments of, um, Incredible irony, I guess. Uh, you know, there's so many ironic twists to the story. We didn't even mention the fact that that Jeff Dedarian was the reason the cameraman was there that night was that he himself was doing a story on fire safety at a big event as such as his, and they were getting the B-roll at his own club to imagine, the story. It was there that they were doing a story about public venue safety. So clearly, someone thought that was a safe building because only an idiot would send a camera crew to do a story in a building if they knew that it was a dangerous death trap of a building. So yeah, that's, a, that's, that's one of those twists. You just shake your head. I just can't believe that happened. And there was another moment like that when the uh, survivors told and, and the victim's families told of uh, being informed about who was going to be indicted in the case. Can you tell a little bit about that story? Yes, we, we talked at the beginning about how that the, the people who are selected to be the main subject of this book, uh, here we have spent all this time talking about the Tadarians, but in fact, the Tadarians are just part of this story. Uh, other people uh, are central characters uh, because they were there at the fire, survived the fire, and went on to do incredible things. Um, and they bear witness to key moments in this. And one of them uh, is a woman, Gina Russo. Uh, she was basically, you know, left for dead inside this fire. Uh, she barely survived. She was one of the worst injured. And she goes on to uh, lead, you know, an, an incredible life, an inspirational life uh, that people are, are going to want to hear about. Um, but uh, during the course of this uh, tragedy, afterwards, when they're trying to determine who's going to be indicted and the, the state decides they were only going to indict uh, three people, and a lot of people didn't think that was right. I mean, part of the questions about justice never being served here, remarkably, there was no way under the law to hold anyone accountable for the people who were hurt. So here's this woman who is burned horribly and no one is going to face any consequences for that whatsoever. The only charges were related to the deaths. There was no provision in the law that allowed that to be, to be held accountable for injuries. So already people are very angry that they feel like you know, they've been betrayed by the system that's supposed to look after them. Uh, so when they announce what indictments, what few indictments are going to be, they gather uh, the family members, about 800 people at this uh, inn. 
and they're sitting in this room as the state is is telling them, you know, uh, you know, we care about you. We want to make sure justice is done. You know, they've heard up until this is months after the fire. They've had all these promises from politicians. Things are going to change. People are going to be held accountable. We're going to fix things so that life is safe. So they're in this room, and somebody notices during this briefing that they're in a death trap. They are literally 800 people have been brought into a death trap. All of the windows in the room where they have been gathered are nailed shut. The only significant exit is up at the other end of the room where all the public officials are, the state officials, the government officials. Uh, that's where you get out. So, so the, the, if tragedy had happened there, if a fire had happened there, for example, uh, the state officials would have saved themselves, but everyone else would have been trapped. Well, somebody notices this and calls them out on it. The media had been banned from attending this meeting. There was a real effort early on by some of the most powerful people in the state to control this story, to control the narrative of it. And one of the things they do did was they blocked the media from covering key moments of it. But we know what happened in that room. We know about that place being a death trap. We know about those windows being nailed shut because Gina Russo was there. And she tells the story and we see it through her eyes. And I will just tell you, I've only given you the setup because what happens in that room when people realize that they have been put in a death trap, that's unbelievable. Yeah. That's unbelievable what happens next. I'll let, I'll let people- It's a moment like you can't make this up or it doesn't seem real, I but yeah. You know, if, you, if a novelist had read it, written it and submitted it to their editor, they would have said, that's not believable. Yeah. Go back and try again. But what yeah. happens is now all the media could report was uh, that basically they heard that things got heated inside the room and that people were upset. Well, that is, that's not the half of it. Yeah. Well, you talk to so many interesting people who've never really gone on the record and, and, and spoken about this event, this uh, tragedy, uh, this case, uh, including the attorney general at the time, the governor at the time, um, and on and on. But there's also a, a, a cameo appearance by former Today Show host Matt Lauer as part of the story, which just goes to show how this, this story has so many legs to it. It does. So this is one of those things every day you find a surprise. Well, uh, Matt Lauer uh, it makes an appearance in, the, in this story and in this book. Uh, and frankly, no one was more surprised than me when one afternoon my phone rings and it's Matt Lauer on the other end. I've been trying to get him to confirm whether or not this was true, what had happened, and went back and forth and, and never was able to get it. Well, of course, uh, as I'm working on this is when the scandal happens at the Today Show. And he becomes one of the most vilified people in the country. He is fired from his position. And so I'm thinking, well, he's never going to talk to me. I'm a reporter. I do some reporting for a fairly well-known newspaper. He's never going to call me back. But you know what? Matt Lauer called me back. And he wanted to talk about it. And he had vivid memories of what had happened. And in fact, uh, he corrected things that otherwise would have been incorrect if they had made it into the book. And so I know people don't want to hear it because he's a, a disliked person, uh, but Matt uh, Lauer was helpful uh, in the writing of this book. Uh, Scott, I want to take some questions soon, but I did want to talk again about the victims and about the restitution that you know came to some, and uh, it was 176 million. Correct. Was that right? Uh, that was distributed uh, to those who had suffered in the fire or to the families of victims. Uh, but did, were they really taken care of with these? Um, you know, every parts of the story has some twist that you don't expect. And that was uh, really a, a heartbreaking one. So uh, first of all, immediately, as soon as this, uh, this fire happens, there are personal injury attorneys who immediately jump into the scene and tell people, you know, I'm gonna get you some money for what these people did to you. And they sign them up as clients. But in fact, it takes years and years and years before that case is ever goes to into a settlement. And eventually $176 million is the settlement, which is very, very impressive. Uh, but of that, the lawyers pocketed about $59 million. So that leaves a lot less that's going to go to these uh, victims' families and survivors. And some of these people were so badly injured, they will need a lifetime of, of care. So, but it gets even worse than that because while people are waiting 
for this to play out and for this settlement to happen, they're preyed upon by lenders and people who are like, look, I'm going to give you money ahead of time before your settlement. And so by the time you come in, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll catch up them on it, you know. So what, in the end, people didn't really get uh, the, the money that they should have because they had signed up for some of these crazy deals. And so when the settlement finally happened, the money went to, to the banker instead of to the individual. And so they, they didn't get the full benefit of that they were supposed to. It's really heartbreaking. Well, there's just so many aspects of the story that we can talk about, but I think we want to know if people have some questions. I'm going to take a look here and see if uh, any questions have come in as yet. Um, don't see, oh, people being a little shy. I don't see any questions yet. So let me ask another one. And I, I wanted to talk a bit more about the victims um, because you know that you follow the story of several people. I, I think we need to reassure people too that there's great moments of triumph in the book and I don't want to spoil it, but um, it's really, a really told from a very personal level. It's not all legalese. Yes, I mean, it's interesting that um, the process I used for, for writing the story is that I really focus on the central characters and tell their stories so you get to know them, the reader gets to connect with them and really see events unfold through their eyes. So in order to do that, I really had to develop a different type of reporting technique. Uh, so what I would do is I would do an interview and I would, about a particular moment, I would write up that chapter and then I would return a few months later and we would sit down and we'd read the chapter together, going through every word, every sentence. And at this little kitchen table read of the draft would be any other people who happened to be in that scene that we were talking about. And we'd have a discussion so that ultimately what we see in, depicted in the book is as accurate as possible. But something else happened at these table reads when we would go through the drafts is that people would start to remember more details. And maybe they would remember things that were very personal and may seem like not on target, they would be sidebar things, memories, but those type of details really fleshed out the people as human beings on the page. And we get to be inside their heads, see what they see, feel what they feel. And sometimes it would be, you know, perhaps it might be a memory about a parent. And they would say, you know, that, that made me think of my mother. And I would say, well, what did you remember about your mother? And then that would make it into the story because that's how people connect with people. We have these shared experiences we're never going to be able to completely understand what these people went through and the horror of it, but we can connect with them in, as human beings and we understand their feelings and, and other aspects of their life that are relatable. This took a long yeah. time. It was extremely emotional to go through that. And honestly, there were days when it was so emotional, uh, I you know, wondered ab about the project and whether or not it was something I really should continue with. I remember one time just going to a person who was not one of the central characters, uh, but I wanted him to vet, to look at uh, a scene that somebody else that he was in, uh, but he, it was told from somebody else's perspective. And by the end of that meeting, the person was just so emotionally destroyed because it has brought back all of these terrible memories. I mean, on that day, I really did wonder if I should do this book or not, if it was, if it was going to cause uh, more harm the process of reporting it. Uh, but in the end, you're right, Pam, uh, the stories are not uh, all terrible. Uh, the inspirational tales are unbelievable. I mean, and just incredible. Cry when they read this book and they don't cry over the tragedy, they cry about the triumphs. The triumphs yeah. that people experience are, are remarkable. Yeah. Well, we have some questions that have come in here. And one I want to uh, ask, uh, this is from Allison. She said, how would you characterize the heroes the night of the concert? The, 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 the moments of heroism are uh, astonishing uh, on a couple different levels. Um, first of all, uh, even though I feel in many ways the, the people who were the victims of this fire were betrayed and failed, uh, at so many levels by so many institutions that we think are going to take care of us in our hour of need. Well, people who did not fail them were the first responders who came to that fire. I mean, imagine this, I've told you that's an inferno. So as people are running out of this horror, the firefighters are running into the flames. They go in there, they take people out. People are alive today because people ran into that inferno and saved people's lives. Incredible. 
The other thing that people want to remember is that if you were saved at that fire and you were brought, you were hurt, you survived. Very, very few people perished who were taken from the scene hurt. The medical miracles are, are amazing. The uh, ability to, to, to save people's lives, it, it's incredible, it's inspiring. Mm -hmm. So there are some heroes there, but there are the other heroes who were not the professional firefighters or the professional uh, uh, rescuers. Uh, ordinary people ran club goers, uh, ran back into that fire to save people after they had themselves emerged, when they realized, and remember, this is all happening in seconds, in seconds. People are judged for the rest of their lives based on the decision they make in one second, and that happened with this fire. And some people ran back into that burning building and brought people out again and again and again until they didn't come out themselves. And those things really happened. Scott, this is a provocative question from Wendy who said, what changes do you hope or anticipate might come out of your investigative journalistic efforts in Trial by Fire? Well, I'm hoping uh, that people remember this and talk about it and take some action. Uh, I am concerned that the, the lessons that should have been learned from this fire really weren't. Uh, it's really interesting when you study the history of fires, and I do that a little bit in, in the book, I say that this is the um, deadliest uh, fire uh, 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 in modern American history. And I, I, what I divide the modern line for firefighters has to do with the Beverly Hills Supper Club fire in 1977, uh, when uh, like 100 and, oh gosh, I can't remember, 165 people were killed at this uh, club, very similar in that it was a death trap of a building that went up in flames and people were trapped and died. Uh, but after that fire in 1977, uh, and this is probably no coincidence, it was the first class action lawsuit of any significance in America. They really took a hard look at the fire codes in America and they made some changes. Up until that point, like five, six, 7,000 people died per year in fires. After the Beverly Hills Supper Club and the lessons that were learned there, the number fell to about 2,500 per year. And frankly, it's been at 2,500 per year ever since. It really has not improved despite that. So people need to look at the station fire and they need to learn the lessons. And the lessons have, are, are all over the place. Uh, one of them is that we need to relearn our fear of fire. Uh, the fact is in the modern era, when we see fire, it's generally in a, in a lovely fireplace at a, in a hotel lobby. We don't cook with it anymore. We don't heat our homes with open flames anymore. And so we are not as afraid of fire as we should have been. Imagine if instead of people thinking that was a special effect on the stage, had immediately uh, started to evacuate the building. Certainly more people would be alive in this incident. We also need to learn that our built, some buildings are out there are death traps because they haven't been properly inspected. Uh, and that certainly happened in the case of the station fire. Uh, look, in 2016, I'm in San Francisco right now, and right now, now talking to you, but just close from here in Oakland, there was the ghost ship fire. 36 people died, uh, similar to the station in that the building was a death trap and that had not been properly inspected and it was not a safe building. That was in 2016. So what happened? What happened between 2003 and 2016? The lesson clearly was not learned and people still died. So we need to hear that. I think. The book only is only out this week, and so there's been a limited uh, ability for me to check on the reaction to it. But probably the parts that I'm most grateful when I see, I've seen dozens and dozens and dozens of reviews on Goodreads and Amazon, where people have said, you know, I, I didn't know about this until I saw this book. Those, I'm, I'm, that's what I want to hear. I want to see people, people in Rhode Island know this tragedy, they live this tragedy. It's very, very hard for them to revisit this tragedy. But what they need to know, but by having this tragedy, this story now at all in one place for people to consider, there's a much better chance that people are gonna remember what happened and act on it so that it doesn't happen again. Mm -hmm. John wants to know if your relationship has changed, your relationship to fire has changed since writing this book. You know, I notice, and I'm not the only person after this tragedy, I notice where the exits are when I go to a big event. Uh, I went to a concert uh, at, here in San Francisco at the Bill Graham Auditorium in December. This all before COVID when we could go to events. And I noticed that it was just too full. 
I, I was I was really concerned that uh, if tragedy hit there, that people would not make it out alive. Mm -hmm. uh, I went to a concert at Foxborough Stadium uh, to see Ed Sheeran, and uh, I, we were so crammed in in our seats. I remember thinking, "There's there's no way that I'm that I'm getting the required seven square feet that's supposed to be given for each patron at, at a at a venue like that." So I am very concerned that if uh, you know tragedy strikes. Uh, whether or not in these big venues and these crowded venues, whether or not we really can get out alive. Mm -hmm. Scott, Shana wants to ask you if you can, she wants to circle back and talk about the triumphs in the book. Is there one little moment without giving anything away that is a particularly um, heartening? Well, I, I think that, um, uh, gosh, I don't want to give anything away. <laughs> you think that, uh, look, um, in that video, we see a memorial, uh, the memorial to the victims. So the person who's more responsible uh, for that than anyone, although she may argue about it, uh, is this woman, Gina Russo, who was uh, burned horribly, uh, lost loved ones in the fire. Uh, and frankly, she went to a very dark place like many of the victims did. Uh, because they were largely abandoned by the system that was supposed to protect them in the first place and then supposed to help them afterwards. Uh, you know, we think of our charitable system as something that's going to jump in and, and take care of people after a disaster like this. But the fact in this case, <clears throat> these were not kind of the typical people that received charity. These were rock and rollers. These were people out to have a good time. Working class, hardworking, blue collar types. And so... Uh, the charity system really kind of abandoned them after all of this. They were there for a little while, for a number of months, but remember these people needed support and help for years. So it is inspirational that these survivors got together and started a fund to help one another through the tough times. That's amazing that they did that. It's shameful that the that society at, at large did not step up to help these people, but it's amazing that they did it. And Gina was part of that. And then Gina goes on, to then say, you know, we need to take this place where this horrible things happened and we need to make it a memorial so people can remember their loved ones and so that we don't forget. And then she did that too. She's an amazing person. Mm. Well, Cassie here has a question about uh, the band's road manager and wants to know if he was ever criminally charged for actually starting the fire. So the road manager uh, lit off the fireworks. The fireworks were illegal. Uh, he claimed that he had permission, but he claimed that at a lot of places and the uh, club owners in, uh, at the station said they did not have permission. And frankly, there were a dozen other club owners all across the United States that were ready to testify had there ever been trials who would say that they lit off fireworks at their places too and did not have permission. So he struck a plea bargain and he served uh, about 18 months uh, in, uh, in prison uh, for for uh, the 100 deaths. So, and that happened before the Dedarians were up for their trials. And I have to say, it was a stunner uh, when people thought, well, wait a minute, you can, you can literally kill someone and only serve 18 months uh, for that happening. And so there was such anger about that, that by the time it came to the Dedarians and that they would faced a trial, the pressure was enormous to convict someone convict anyone for what had happened. And so that sets the stage for what happened to them and, uh, and, and how the, the legal system uh, treated them. So uh, Daniel Beakley, he did serve his time. He actually is somewhat considered by some uh, because he did plead guilty uh, as some sort of folk hero uh, who basically you know, took the hit, the patsy who took the hit while other people were just as culpable or as responsible. The book does raise some questions about that, frankly. Uh, we look at the evidence, we look at the paper trail, we look what warning signs this man were, was given ahead of time. And he's really not the kind of an innocent bystander that some people have made him out to be. There mm -hmm. were real significant warnings to him about what he was doing and the danger it presented. Now in fairness to Daniel Beakley, there was no way for him to know setting off these fireworks that the building itself was so dangerous and was so incendiary. So he obviously had no intention of hurting anyone. Uh, there's, in fact, that's one of the, the things about this case that really goes home, hits home is that none of the people 
who uh, were involved in this tragedy intended to hurt anyone, and nobody says that. But Patsy, Fall Guy, that's not so clear when you actually examine the evidence. Uh, we have an interesting question from Tina who says, with all the changes in media currently, do you think this story would be handled differently today? Well, I have to say, uh, people had a lot more resources in 2003, television stations, newspapers, uh, to cover a story like this. I mean, think about it, we, you know, we, we're gonna, we were sitting in 2020 criticizing people for what they did so many years ago. And we have the, we have the ability to look back through um, uh, knowing all that we know. Uh, this was overwhelming. Think of this. You know, Pamela, you can talk about this because you were on the air uh, when this happened. And so uh, for, for people that know Pam, she was the morning anchor. So this happens at uh, 11.07, the, the gravity of it, it's happening all night long, the fire. So you're called into the newsroom, you have to report this and you go on the air at what? Uh, in the early, early like hours of the morning. Mm -hmm. and, and what do you know at that time? You know, we knew very little. It was an overnight story. It was breaking. It was, you couldn't get near the scene, even though all our reporters were there. And and we were in the story. This was the, Jeff Daddary, the, the owner of the nightclub was coming aboard uh, Channel 12 as my co-anchor. And um, we were horrified. You, me, everyone in the state had someone they knew in the fire or we hadn't learned that they were in it yet. And at first there was no reports of any deaths. It was just, I kept talking about the irony that he was doing a story on venue safety and how to get out safely. And then um, it turns into this inferno. And it wasn't until later in the morning, the word came that there'd been one death. And we were just horrified. This take, took a whole new turn. At that point, we hadn't even let our minds go there. And then a few minutes later, they said, no, there's three. No, there's five. And it kept going and kept going until we get up to, you know, a hundred. And it was, uh, it, it was, we were profoundly shaken and we're in the middle of the story. And I must have stayed on for about four hours. And then finally they brought in um, some reinforcements. But to this day, I mean, it has changed um, me and uh, so many people in Rhode Island forever. Well, yeah. And so think of that, you know, that uh, we now know today 100 people were killed, but we did, that's not how it happened. It didn't happen all at once. Uh, we found out a little bit at a time that there had been a death and then it grew and grew and grew. You know, people need to know that it took the better part of a week to figure out who was in there. It's not like when you go to a rock show that there's a sign-in sheet and everybody hands over their IDs. We don't know who's in there. We don't know who was, even people who bought tickets don't necessarily show up. Mm -hmm. um, and so the, the, uh, the, what had to be determined was overwhelming. So now, you know, it's overwhelming for everyone from the, the investigators and the police and the firefighters and then the forensic people and the medical examiners, but then you've got the media that has to try to make sense out of this incredibly senseless thing. Mm -hmm. So just the concept of uh, covering the deaths of 100 people. I know that the local newspaper did do profiles of all 100 uh, people who perished, but they did it over time. Very reminiscent of 9-11, where the New York Times spent the better part of the year making sure that every single person had a, a story, a remembrance in the newspaper. Uh, I think they, I think they ended up uh, winning a Pulitzer Prize for that. The fact that they did those stories, uh, overwhelming, overwhelming to 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 make that commitment to make sure that this was told properly. Right. So you know, the book does uh, examine and uh, puts a harsh uh, spotlight on some of the things that the media did, and some of them are very unexplainable to this day. I mean, at the height of the agony, when there's such anger and despair about what has happened, uh, inexplicably, uh, the newspaper, the local newspaper, decides to print the home addresses, the actual street addresses of the Didarian brothers, something that no reputable newspaper would do anywhere in the United States because it's so dangerous and exposes people to possible harassment or harm. But it happened. Right. I mean, this was, a lot was going on and a lot 
uh, you know, we look through and question now and, and wonder like, how did that impact things? How did that change uh, what we know and, or the course of the investigation or, or having the public uh, having access to uh, uh, the full set of facts. So, yeah. so I, you know, I will take the hit that I am uh, critical of what was done, but at the same time, I have to admit it was overwhelming and I don't know how, uh, how else it would have been done. I, I, it's just, it's, it's so much to, to, to take in. Well, Scott, as you say, I mean, even some of the people, I knew people that were in the fire who survived. I didn't hear about that till months later sometimes. It, there was just so much confusion around it. There were so many people, you know, getting treatment. You wouldn't know who it was. Uh, we only have time for one more question. And um, it was in regards to, um, this is from Kate, Katie, and she said that was it helpful to you to study how similar incidents, other suspicious fires or similar events unfolded, or did you just focus on this one story? No, certainly as part of the uh, book, I definitely look at our, our tr very troubling history of fire in the United States and how things were handled. I mean, it's just one misstep after another where lessons that should have been learned were not learned. You know, the Coconut Grove fire, which is just up the road in Boston, uh, just after World War II, uh, like 492 people died in that tragedy. Now there were some things we learned from that. I mean, that was a fire where the only way in and out was this revolving door. And so the revolving door quickly became jammed and then people perished inside. The place was uh, filled with very flammable uh, materials. So we should have learned then you know, about that we want to make sure that the interiors of these public spaces do not include a lot of flammable materials. But in, in the case, obviously, of the station, uh, the walls and the ceilings were padded with it. You know, the law really requires that, that those things be checked and tested. That did not happen uh, with the station. It should have been done by the fire inspector. It was not done. So we see, unfortunately, we have a tragedy. We think, well, we learned our lesson on that uh, and we won't do that again. We'll make some changes. But then where the change is actually made. So yes, you have to look at the past to understand this case. And perhaps when you understand this case and this tragedy, maybe, just maybe, we can make sure that it, it doesn't happen again. Trial by fire, Scott James. It's great having this conversation with you and to be reunited once again. And uh, I'm gonna call Evan back and I think he has some more information for our guest tonight. Oh, thank you, Pamela. This is wonderful. And thank you, Scott. This has been a fascinating uh, story and um, conversation. Um, thank you all uh, who've tuned in um, for joining us. And um, uh, I've just dropped the, uh, the link again into the chat, but I encourage you to get signed copies of Trial by Fire um, from Booksmith. We'll deliver them straight to your door, or you can um, come on by the store uh, from 11 to 6 any day to pick it up if you're local. Um, hope to see some of you guys tomorrow night. We have a group reading by Omnidon Authors. Um, otherwise, uh, go go vote, go vote right now, um, and and hopefully we can get some government officials um, into place to actually um, maybe you know change some of these some of these policies and make this a, a safer society for us all. Um, thank you, thank you again, um, Pam, for being with us tonight, and okay. and Scott, uh, congratulations on this book. Um, thank you. I appreciate it. Absolutely. Um, good night, everybody. Take care. Good night, everyone.